This morning on Night Watch, the U.S. military and the Peruvian drug war. I don't think the solution is simply to have a hands-off policy. I think at this juncture, uh, it, it, a, a, a modest but a substantial uh, support for the military of Peru uh, is, is very much called for and very much necessary. A former senator looks back. After two years, when I go back to Washington, which I do infrequently, it's like I could have stepped out of there yesterday. Uh, everything is exactly the same. Problems are not being solved in Washington. Promoting Dick Tracy. They don't show it to anybody, and so they build up anticipation. Everybody wants to see, even the critics are going, show us this thing already so we can see something and have something to say. As of now, it's all just sort of like people just hoping that they can make sense about Dick Tracy before they see it. Also, a musical treasure and a pianist's pleasure. Now in Washington, filling in for Charlie Rose, here is CBS News correspondent Karen Smith. Good morning. In a controversial move by the Bush administration, the Pentagon is now poised to help engineer the fight against the drug war at its source. Agreements are falling into place that would dramatically increase the U.S. commitment of money and manpower in the Andean drug-producing countries, especially targeted Peru and Bolivia, the two countries that grow almost all of the world's coca for the production of cocaine. But plans for U.S. military training and equipment for war-torn Peru are on hold. We want to look this morning at the use of the U.S. military in the war on drugs, especially in the Andean region. Joining us from Boston is David Scott Palmer, professor of political science and international relations at Boston University. Dr. Palmer, give us the arguments, if you will, for and against the use of the U.S. military in this sort of a situation? Well, each country uh, has its own uh, particular situation, and, and the response should vary in a well, I have Peru. With the country. Well, I have Peru in mind. If we're looking at Peru, uh, the problem in Peru is fundamentally a problem both of a drug uh, production problem and of a uh, guerrilla problem, that needs, both of which need to be addressed. So the military response is primarily to deal with the guerrilla problem. In other words, if you get at the guerrillas, you get at the drug problem? Well, they're complementary aspects. They tend to overlap. Uh, the responses uh, are different for each uh, part of the problem. But so far, U.S. policy has uh, focused on the uh, dealing with the drug, uh, the coca production problem, interdiction and production, uh, whereas the guerrillas are very active in the same area that the mm -hmm. drugs are produced. Do you think this is an appropriate, A, appropriate, and B, effective use of uh, U.S. military? In, in my judgment, in the particular case of Peru, uh, the use of military, U.S. military, to support and assist the Peruvian military uh, is, is a very appropriate response and probably uh, overdue. You say that, Dr. Palmer, even though the Peru's in the midst, uh, struggling really with a, an election process and has a runoff uh, in less than a month? Exactly. My guess is that this uh, would not come to pass until after the uh, election occurs, that the proposals are going forward now. Well, partly because it's seen, at least by some, as disruptive to that process or something of an intervention in Peruvian affairs. There are those who argue that this is taking us down a, a very unwise path. Yeah, I understand that, that perception, and it's certainly a legitimate uh, concern. On the other hand, however, I think we have to appreciate that this buildup uh, regarding the, uh, the drug problem and the guerrilla problem uh, from the U.S. policy perspective been, has been going on in consultation with the Peruvians for, for about a year and a half now. So it's not anything that's brand new uh, as far as U.S.-Peruvian relations are concerned. Well, what's, what's realistic and what's practical here? In other words, the Shining Path guerrillas, as they're called, in Peru have been a force in that country, a disruptive force, for a decade, and proven very entrenched, very difficult to, to get out of there. Uh, is it realistic to believe that the uh, intervention, uh, limited uh, intervention of U.S. military assistance is really going to make any difference? Well, I think at this juncture, that assistance could be very important. I agree with you that it's not likely to eliminate the problem overnight. Sendero has a 50-year trajectory, after all. Uh, 
uh, but the Peruvian military uh, is quite beleaguered. It's quite pressed for resources. This, at this juncture, I think would be a very welcome infusion of, of collaborative uh, initiative to help the Peruvian military uh, deal with a problem that they've had some difficulty with from time to time over the past several years. Mm -hmm. What What is, in your opinion, the likely impact on democracy in Peru, on the process? Uh, in, in my judgment, the military forces in Peru have committed themselves to the democratic process. They've had ample opportunity to uh, respond with a traditional coup, uh, and they've chosen uh, at several junctures not to do so. I think this will continue to be their position. The de democratic process needs a shield, however, and, and the Shining Path movement uh, represents precisely the, uh, the, the, an extreme which is, uh, which is violent and which is intolerable uh, for the democratic process. Therefore, mm -hmm. you need a military to support. Critics, you know, complain that this is, in their words, a dirty little war with human rights violations on both sides, not something that the U.S. ought to get involved in. What do you say to that? Well, that's fair enough. It is. It's a horrible situation. There have been terrible atrocities committed on both sides. Uh, both uh, America's Watch and Amnesty International have documented those uh, atrocities from the government side, somewhat less so on the, on the Shining Path side, which are equally uh, despicable. Uh, yet, I don't think the solution is simply to have a hands-off policy. I think at this juncture, uh, it, it, a, a, a modest but a substantial uh, support for the military of Peru uh, is, is very much called for and very much necessary. And how would you define success in this, Dr. Palmer? In other words, what's realistic in terms of curbing the flow of drugs uh, from Peru to the U.S. market? Well, now we're talking about another issue. Uh, the, uh, the military, this is one of the confusions that sometimes exists. The military assistance is not intended to deal with the drug problem. The military assistance is intended to deal primarily with the Shining Path problem. Uh, the the uh, existing assistance and proposed expanded assistance uh, for the Drug Enforcement Administration and the ancillary agencies uh, to help the police forces uh, deal with the drug problem is another issue altogether. So I think uh, if we're looking at uh, a measure of success of the military assistance, uh, it would probably be measured more in terms of reduction in uh, number of casualties, reduction in the capacity of Shining Path to carry out its operations, particularly in the upper Wayaga Valley, which uh, they've controlled for most of the past two years, and that's the major center of uh, drug production, coca production, in Peru. Would we have American soldiers at risk here? I don't think it can be avoided. I think there are, uh, if, if they're going to be 50 to 100 to 200 advisors on a regular basis uh, in that part of the country, they're going to be uh, susceptible to uh, at least being caught in situations that, are, that are, have the potential for, for casualties. Okay. We'll take a break and come back and talk a little more about Bolivia and the situation there, the other major coca producer. So stay with us. Nightwatch will be right back. <laughs> Remember when life insurance was something simple you bought to help pay your final expenses? Back when benefits never went down and premiums never went up? And you could buy just a few thousand dollars of coverage for only a few dollars a month? Well, solid, affordable life insurance is not a thing of the past. I'm Ed McMahon, here to tell you you can still get cash value life insurance. Old-fashioned security designed to last a lifetime for just $6.95 a unit per month. No, you don't have to buy $50,000 or $100,000 or more of coverage. You don't have to pay a lot of money either. This easy-to-budget life insurance will never go up in cost, and your benefit will never go down simply because of your age. Best of all, because of a two-year limited benefit period, you cannot be turned down. If you're age 50 or over, your acceptance is guaranteed. You are eligible for up to six units of coverage. For a woman age 50, that's more than $10,000 in protection that will never reduce simply because you grow older. There's no medical exam, not even one health question. That's not just a promise. It's a guarantee in writing from Colonial Pen Life Insurance Company. This information and guarantee of acceptance will be mailed to you without cost or obligation when you call this toll-free number. That's all it takes to start providing help for your final expenses. 
So next time someone says you can't get affordable life insurance anymore, tell them to call this number. Better yet, pick up the phone and call toll-free for your free information package today. Here's how. Thanks, Ed. To find out how you can get life insurance to help with your final expenses, write or call Colonial Penn. Dial 1-800-533-8888. And this information package will be mailed right to your home. No salesman will visit. 1-800-533-8888. Don't forget to dial the 800 because that makes it a free call. Dial 1-800-533-8888. Welcome back. We are talking about an issue that has troubled many here in Washington, the Bush administration's proposals to use expanded U.S. military force in Latin America, particularly in the Andean countries, in order to fight the guerrilla movements there and the drug war. We were talking, and, and we were talking with Professor David Scott Palmer of Boston University, and we were talking before about Peru, the situation in Bolivia, the other major producer of the coca that makes its way to this country eventually as cocaine. Um, what's the situation there? Yeah, the situation is, uh, is a somewhat different one from, uh, from the Peruvian situation, that there is a major drug production uh, issue in Bolivia. It is not complicated as the Peruvian situation is by the uh, guerrilla violence and guerrilla activity issue. And in Bolivia, what's, what's realistic and what do you think ought to be U.S. policy there? Well, the, the Bolivian government has proceeded uh, with some cooperation from the U.S. government over the past two years for a, uh, a, a, a coca uh, crop substitution program uh, that seems to have had some initial successes and uh, has the potential of having substantial successes uh, in the future, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. Production is down, and uh, the Bolivian president has been here telling, uh, telling the White House that because it's down, it's time now for a significant increase in economic assistance to Bolivia. Um, the emphasis these days, however, in the Bush administration seems to be not on economic and political assistance, but, but money that is more directly targeted against the drug war. Yeah, I, I think that's been, uh, that's been the perception, and I think part of that is because of the substantial increase in resources uh, in a variety of areas that have been proposed by the, by the administration this, uh, this past year. Uh, I think, nevertheless, uh, there is a substantial increase, uh, a, a dramatic increase, a, a tenfold increase in proposed resources, economic resources, designed to deal with other aspects of the problem, uh, the drug production problem, in, particularly in Bolivia and Peru, also in Colombia. Uh, so that uh, there's, there's this dimension of it that I think is, uh, is, mm -hmm. uh, is also a very important part of the, of the strategy. So you would support that, I gather. You would support increasing that assistance. Uh, I, 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 think it's, uh, I think it's very important that it be done and that, uh, and that there be a, uh, a recognition of the very important differences between uh, the situation in Bolivia and the situation in Peru and that there be a different, a variegated response to those, uh, to those differences. Mm -hmm. Several months ago, the leaders of these countries and uh, Colombia met with President Bush at Cartagena. What came out of that? What do you see as a student of that area that is the consequence of that uh, summit? Well, the summit at Cartagena came at a very awkward time for the uh, Bush administration. It came, as you know, shortly after the Panama intervention. And I think there's a, there was a heightened concern on the part of the, uh, of the, of the, the heads of state of uh, Colombia, Bolivia, and Peru to uh, the, uh, the possibility of increased military uh, ties and connections, possibly even uh, in their perception intervention by the United States in the region. So I think it's in that context that there is this, uh, this heightened sensitivity to the possibility of a growing U.S. military presence in the region. So it's something that does have to be looked at very carefully and must be looked at in the context of the additional economic uh, assistance that is to be provided for crop substitution, uh, for alternative employment, et cetera, et cetera. Well, my impression here in Washington is that that, that heightened uh, sensitivity is not restricted to uh, Latin America, that there is a heightened sensitivity in this, in this town and in Congress to these issues, particularly following the invasion of Panama, 
That certainly set a tone. It's caused as much of a uh, uh, rising concern here as it has there. Yes, I think that's a fair, a fair concern, uh, and it's a fair assessment of the situation. Uh, I think that, uh, that it is necessary, however, to distinguish between the circumstances that led to this very special case of, of direct military intervention by the United States in Panama and the, uh, the kind of activities that are appropriate uh, with uh, the, uh, the governments of Colombia, uh, uh, Peru, and Bolivia. Mm -hmm. And, and is, there a, is there a larger strategy, in your opinion, that ought to be applied in these countries vis-a-vis -vis the United States uh, in order to get at the problem? Well, the, the, of course, the whole drug uh, problem, drug issue is a, is, is a central one for the United States, uh, both domestically and internationally. Uh, and the fact that the, uh, the region is uh, the, the producer of all of the, of the coca, uh, which makes the cocaine that, that Americans consume, uh, makes the Andean countries, uh, Bolivia and Peru, because they produce virtually all the coca, as you said, and Colombia, which manufactures most of it for export uh, uh, as cocaine into the United States. Uh, this is why these areas have become uh, the object of considerable attention. And the increase in proposed assistance is a response to that uh, issue. We can differ on whether uh, we should have more resources spent uh, in, at home uh, dealing with supply problem or whether we should focus more on the demand problem. I think in the, in the Indian countries, as I see it, there's a, there's a shift from uh, uh, crop eradication to interdiction. Uh, and in the special case of Colombia, the Colombian government has responded uh, very courageously uh, with gr at great risk uh, to uh, the challenge posed by uh, the, the drug kingpins there. And, what's, uh, been and the what net, what's been the net effect of that? The net effect of that so far has been a sharp decline in the price of the coca leaf in, uh, in uh, Bolivia and Peru, leading, I think, to what uh, President uh, Paz of Zamora of uh, Bolivia uh, says is uh, an opportune moment to take advantage of the decline in coca prices below the cost of production in some cases uh, to uh, move rapidly toward crop substitution. And I think that the infrastructure is in place, in Bolivia in particular, because it's something that has been tried from time to time in the past in cooperation with the United States uh, over, the, over, over the last several years. All right. Dr. Palmer, thank you very much for uh, filling us in on a subject that uh, one suspects is only going to grow in uh, its controversy and place in, in the public attention. Thanks very much. I thank you, sir. Stay with us. Night Watch will be right back. Want a party? Call New York's most exciting party lines, where you'll be connected with up to eight friendly people who want to meet you. Call the love line for sincere singles. Dial 550-LOVE. Call the wild line for wild times. Dial 550-WILD. Call the soul line for soul singles. Dial 550-SOUL. Want a party? Call New York's most exciting party lines. 15 cents a minute, 40 cents the first. Not available in New Jersey. Adults only. Remember when we thought we could change the world and others who thought so too? I still believe in love and caring, and so does Foster Parents Plan. For over 50 years, they've been linking sponsors like me to needy children in other countries. And Foster Parents Plan develops programs that free the child and its family from poverty forever. I haven't given up on making a difference. I'm changing the world for one little girl named Jenny. Won't you reach out and make a world of difference too? Yeah, we're having a problem with the car. It sounds like... It doesn't sound like that. It's... At Meineke, we can't always tell what's wrong with a car by the sound of the customer. But we can tell a lot from our free undercar inspection. We check your exhaust system, shocks, brakes, and more at no charge. We'll show you what's wrong and what's right. Then you'll know the price before any work begins. You have a muffler for this. So bring your car to Meineke. We'll give you a lift without taking you for a ride. 
Life is more important than material things. You don't need all the gold and the diamond rings. Yeah, you make a lot of money and you make it fast. You get busted. You going straight to a jail cell, man. It's going on. Police are getting serious. I don't mean to diss, but you gotta get out of this. Straight up, straight up, man. It's a known fact. It ain't enough money that can get your life back. We're here to tell you that drugs are for suckers. Straight up. Straight up. Police. Straight up. Straight up. Freeze. Straight up. When friends don't stop friends from drinking and driving, friends die. Drinking and driving can kill a friendship. Welcome back. It's almost summer, and that means it's either sizzle or fizzle time for the Hollywood studios. The studios make the bulk of their annual profits in these soon-to-be lazy days. And this year, they're pulling out all the stops some big budget action and comedy movies. Perhaps the highest expectations are for the film Dick Tracy, directed by and starring Warren Beatty with Madonna as Breathless Mahoney. I'm taking this bomb out of the headlines. I'm rubbing him out. Dick Tracy, watch out! Dick Tracy to me. I say we kill Tracy now. You challenge me, we all go down! Can I want to know who killed Lips Man. Not the bad, not the bad, big boy, not the bad. Man. Oh, I know, but I'm gonna miss you. But all fan love and business. Whose side are you on? Side I'm always on. Mine. We'll be seeing sequels again this year, including Die Hard 2 with Bruce Willis. This time, the action is at L.A. Airport. Story of my life. Wayne, is this what you were expecting? Uh, this is just the beginning. This is how I spent Christmas last year. Eddie Murphy will team up again with Nick Nolte in the film Another 48 Hours. It's the new version of what was considered by many to be the classic buddy movie. Another 48 Hours? Now look, Reggie, this time I promise you it's gonna be different. Let me tell you something. I ain't working for you. I don't like you and I don't trust you. <laughs> Welcome back, Reg. With us this morning to look ahead to the summer movie season is Elvis Mitchell, film critic for California Magazine. Elvis, welcome. Good morning. I just want to brush in the broken glass yeah, ex before we get started. Here. Exactly. Exactly. Summer, that's, a, that's the big time, not Christmas and New Year's? Well, you know, it used to be until it was discovered that during the summertime, kids have a lot of money, mm -hmm. and they go see movies again and again and again, and that's how we first... I guess the big pattern breaker for that was Jaws 15 years ago, which became suddenly the biggest grocer of all time. Uh, before that, you had a movie like The Exorcist, which was the biggest gross of all time, which was the Christmas release. But then Jaws turned that around. And then and the Jaws was a summer release? It was huge, a huge summer release. Yeah. It just caught everybody by, mm -hmm. by surprise. And then Star Wars after that pretty much sealed. In fact, George Lucas tries to release all of his movies in May about the time of Memorial Day because he feels it's a good luck, a good luck charm for him. And so now summer officially begins Memorial Day. Right. You know, these budgets on the films get bigger and bigger. $50 million, $60 million. You wonder uh, how much money they have to make before they turn a profit, or certainly before, say, Art Buckwald sees any profit. I think Art Buckwald maybe owes Paramount some money at this point about that whole Eddie Murphy thing. Um, a movie has to make two to three times its cost to break even. So we have movies like... Uh, Days of Thunder, which is said to cost $60 million. Die Hard 2, which will cost about $50, $60 million. The Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, Total Recall, which may cost over $70 million. And you have to remember, you've been paying this kind of money for a movie starring somebody who barely speaks English. Well, why, do you, why do you have to make two to three times to make a profit? Well, because there are a certain number of costs built in. There was an article in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago that shows how this works. There's the initial budget, and the studio uh, has costs that it pays itself. Uh, certain interest charges, certain charges for use of the studio, and the next thing you know... But that's Prince, profit. There's profit laid in all of Essentially, it. yes. They, they do make a profit before the movie gets out. They aren't suffering. This isn't like them having a church social and they've got to ask right. for extra money to feed the orphans. No, this is a business. And they do see money. But for the movie to officially break into profit, they say that's a break. It, it costs two or three times that. Well, we'll leave that to Paramount and Art Buckwald's lawyers. But, uh, but in fact, in fact, 
the budgets are huge, and they seem to be getting out of hand. Seventy million dollars, you said. Seventy million dollars for total recall. But on the other hand, Warren Beatty made Dick Tracy for Touchdown. Actually, it's the first Disney film to have a lot of violence in it. Mm -hmm. But they're very good at Disney about keeping costs down. It, it said that Beatty was given a certain amount of money to use to make the movie. And if you were to go over it, it would come out of his own pocket. Well, nobody wants to spend his own money. <laughs> Therefore, Dick Tracy will, will come in under budget. That's an incentive that I think any of us can understand. You look at Dick Tracy, you look at the Ninja Turtles, you look at Batman, and you say, what's going on? Comic book fever here? What well, it certainly it? seems to be happening. Um, Batman sort of took people by surprise. Again, this goes back to, to Superman of about 10 years mm -hmm. ago, which surprised everybody. And at the time, it was the most expensive movie ever made. But they sort of amortized it by making two Superman movies essentially at once. Well, uh, so then they were able to get Superman 2 out of the making of Superman 1. And, and now then, 15, 12 years later, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which started as a comic and nobody knew about, mm -hmm. it caught on as a cartoon and then kids went out to see it, but Batman surprised everybody. Nobody thought it would do as well as it did. And now between uh, Disney being a very shrewd marketer of movies and going with something like Dick Tracy, which is fairly well known, and, and using Madonna, there are a bunch, of, a bunch of very smart factors involved in this movie. And the other thing too is something like Batman or Dick Tracy is they don't show it to anybody. And so they build up anticipation. Everybody mm -hmm. wants to see. Even the mm -hmm. critics are going, show us this thing already so we can see something and have something to say. As of now, it's all just sort of like people just hoping that they can make sense about Dick Tracy before they see it. And of course, there's anticipation built up from the familiarity of the subject itself. You know who Dick Tracy is. You know who Breathless Mahoney is, or you might. Anyway. Actually, I think a lot of people really don't know who Dick Tracy is, nor do they know who Warren Beatty is. I mean, Dick Tracy really hasn't been popular for about 30 That's years. That's certainly true. And you don't see them in any newspapers, and you say Warren Beatty, and people go, huh? You say Ishtar, and they go, oh. oh that turkey. Yeah, that that Warren Beatty. Yeah. Didn't he make Heaven's Gate, too? I mean, yeah. people don't... It's yeah. been a long a generation of moviegoers, almost, since Heaven Can Wait, 1978. Mm -hmm. And they just don't know. And... But again, Disney is very good at marketing this stuff. I mean, they can sell almost anything. So are we going to see uh, Doonesbury, the movie? Yeah, I hope not. <laughs> Let's put an end to this stuff. But see, what we get with the mutant turtles and, and Dick Tracy and Batman is a classic good versus evil struggle, which is what we want to see anyway, and lots of gunplay. Uh, unless BD starts carrying a gun, I don't think we'll see Doonesbury on the screen anymore. No, there's not enough action. It's, uh, and, and poking fun at past presidents won't do in films a year or two later. Let's, we're going to take a break, and we'll come back and talk about specifically about some of the films that are coming up. So stay with us. Nightwatch will be right back. Want an adjustable bed, but don't think you can afford one? Then you haven't priced Craftmatic adjustable beds lately. Craftmatic Model 2 beds cost hundreds less than these quality flat beds. And this Craftmatic Model 3 is available at 50% of Craftmatic 2's low cost. 50%. Craftmatic Model 3 and 2 beds adjust to all these healthful positions and offer optional heat and massage, yet cost less than these quality flat beds. Get our free catalog by mail, including information on Craftmatic 3's at savings of 50% of Craftmatic 2's low cost. Hello. I'd like to receive your free catalog and 50% information by mail. Certainly, sir. It's easy. So call for this free catalog right away. Call 1-800-BED-9115. That's 1-800-BED-9115. Toll free. Call 1-800-BED-9115. Buy any original classic model contoured chair and I, Art Linkletter, will send you your choice of a fabulous 19-inch Panasonic color TV, microwave oven, or VCR. But don't buy a contour chair for one of these. Get one because it's the most restful, healthful chair you ever relaxed in. Contour chairs help to relieve low back pain, poor venous blood circulation in your legs, edema, and swelling of the legs. Call toll-free and get full details on our fabulous offer. I chose the Panasonic Color TV. I took the VCR. I got the microwave. Hello. I'd like to have your catalog and certificate mailed to me free. Certainly, sir. See how easy it is? Call for your free catalog and certificate right away. Call 1-800-435-4800. That's 1-800-435-4800. Toll free. Call 1-800-435-4800.
Still to come on Nightwatch, more on summer movies, a politician reborn, classical music lost, and a pianist found. Now in Washington, filling in for Charlie Rose, here is CBS News correspondent Terrence Smith. Welcome back. We're talking with Elvis Mitchell, the film critic for California Magazine, about a whole bunch of new movies that are coming up. Uh, we talked about Dick Tracy. What about Die Hard 2? Um, a sequel, obviously. Well, yeah, and it's a sequel. Well, that's the sort of thing about all these movies, where they're spending lots of money trying to offer us what I call the Holiday Inn School of Filmmaking, where the best surprise is no surprise. People sort of know what Dick Tracy right. is, and Die Hard 2 is just, again, a, a, another bad airport experience, or another terrorist experience, essentially. And even with the first Die Hard, Bruce Willis was paid $5 million, because at the time he was a TV star, and it was thought that he could do that most important thing, relieving the audience of having to make a decision about him. Ah, it's Bruce Willis. We know who he is. We know mm -hmm. what he does. Therefore, it's not going to be risky on our part to go see the movie. Even though his character was very different than the character he played in Moonlighting. Well, essentially, it's still Bruce Willis wisecracking, joking mm -hmm. around. I mean, f there was no Sybil Shepherd around, fortunately or unfortunately. He got to shoot other people instead. Mm -hmm. and, and, and people were just sort of anticipating, in fact, that maybe Bruce Willis was being overpaid for Die Hard, exactly your point, and that this movie wouldn't do so well, and it turned out to be a big surprise hit of that mm -hmm. summer. It sure was. Um, Eddie Murphy and Nick Nolte work wonderfully together. Uh, again, it's some of that smart aleck quality, it's uh, Nolte's defined, well-defined character. What do you think it is? Well, it's, 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 people sort of like it because Eddie Murphy comes in and he plays Eddie Murphy. And it's kind of interesting to see somebody else who is an actor bring something to those movies because Eddie Murphy and everything else he does essentially gets to upstage everybody else. You know, he's smarter, he's quicker, he's funnier. And, and Nick Nolte brings a kind of, I think, a grounding, a foundation to, to the 48 hours sort of thing that nobody else does. So we do feel a contrast between them. They do come from totally different areas. But again, you know, we're... That was a surprise for people, too. I mean, at the time, Nick Nolte was the big star of that movie, and, and Eddie Murphy just broke through, and Paramount latched onto him and signed him to his huge deal. And now we can see in that clip that Eddie looks literally like a fat cat. He's a little jolly and happy yeah, looking. Now, sure. Nick Nolte looks <laughs> lean and mean nowadays. Uh, another one coming up this summer, Days of Thunder. Tom Cruise, not in an airplane this time, in a stock car. Stock car racing film. Yeah, but it sort of feels like the same thing. Lots of yeah. incense being burned on the set, so it's smoky and ominous and dark and mm -hmm. lots of reedy synthesizer music. And it's funny, in the trailer, which I guess we, we didn't get a chance to see here, he's given almost every entrance in the history of motion pictures. People are standing around, looking at their watches, waiting for him to show up, and then everybody turns around, and then he gets a big entrance on the motorcycle, and the camera, like, shoots him from, from down here. And you're thinking, my God, this is just the trailer. What's the movie going to be like? But it's like they're, they're hedging every bet they possibly can. And that movie is, is, has fallen behind, so it's, it's even more heavily anticipated now because people are thinking, gee, it's got to be really great if they took an extra long time to make it. Not always the rule. There's a new film coming this summer called Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down. And it's part of the whole dispute over ratings and where it fits. This one didn't quite make the cut for an R rating, I gather. Uh, well, what's, is there a real dispute here or manufactured? I think there's an actual dispute, and it's something people have been talking about for a few years, that essentially all X-rated movies are not just porn. The big problem mm -hmm. with releasing an X is the studio doesn't want to put it out because theater chains won't play them, newspapers won't advertise them, and TV stations won't take ads for a movie that are rated X. And so you have to do the next best thing, which is to release it without a rating. Still, there are lots of newspapers that won't accept a, a, a movie ad for an unrated movie. Mm -hmm. uh, All right, let's take a look at, we have a clip from this, and uh, we'll see what the kind of quality of it is. So, watch here. No me mires así. No te miro. Te admiro. Pues no me admires así. Eh, ¿dónde vas con tanta prisa? Estoy empapada. ¿Qué quieres? Nada. No te iba a gustar. Pues mejor no me lo digas. Nos veremos en la fiesta. Sí, sí, claro.
Because she, she certainly makes his wheelchair spin. I so can to see speak, that. I think mine is spinning here. <laughs> Steamy, suggestive, but not radically different from R-rated movies I've seen. Uh, and actually, the movie in itself isn't radically different from many R-rated mm -hmm. pictures. Uh, and what this, this movie is part of, a, a whole wave of movies that are considered by many people to be artistic successes. I mean, they aren't just uh, released to appeal to a prurient interest, but, mm -hmm. uh, but serious uh, aficionados of movies can take these movies seriously. Uh, on a number of levels, actually all these movies that are in fact rated X are failures in some way. This movie by Pedro El Modovar is not one of his best. It feels a bit vacant and hollow as if he sort of burned himself mm -hmm. out from the other stuff. But it's still, that aside, more interesting than much of the other mainstream motion picture releases we see. And it's, it's, it's sort of a shame that, that people are going to be kept out of it by thinking, well, God, there must be something wrong with it if, if they want to give this an X rating. And, and what this is it's really making clear to the MPAA now is that something has to be done. There has to be something between an R and an X, just as there is now something between a G, a, a PG, and the R, which is the PG-13. Well, clear to some, perhaps, but not to all. Jack Valenti had a piece in the op-ed page the, the other day the uh, insisting no need for that. Let me ask you about uh, Jack Nicholson, who's uh, back as a director this time of, of The Two Jakes, which is a sequel to Chinatown, uh, his head of a few years ago. Have you seen it? Do you like it? Uh, actually, I've not seen it, and there must not be a whole lot of confidence in the movie on the behalf of the releasing company Paramount. It was scheduled for release at the end of last year, and you may recall seeing magazine covers with Jack Nicholson mm -hmm. talking about The Two Jakes. I mean, nobody thought the movie would come out literally almost a year later or else those hmm. magazines would held one of those pieces, I think. Um, it was also scheduled for, May, uh, for March and pushed back again. Now we're getting it in the dog days of August. Generally, not a time you release a movie you have a whole lot of confidence in. Uh, and it's actually a sequel to a movie that officially is not a hit. Chinatown maybe barely broke even. It's, it's certainly mm -hmm. a, a success that steam. I mean, it has yes, a lot of respect, does. and it's a remarkable motion picture. And it's good to see somebody try to make a follow-up to a movie that, that actually challenged us on a lot of levels and demand a lot of us as an audience. And, and the word has been for years that, that the 2 Jake script uh, is just an amazing piece of work. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the original screenwriter, Robert Town, was going to direct it. And they shouted days for the film and there were a lot of machinations that essentially had to be settled in court. And in order to save the project, Nicholson took it over. Hmm. But, I mean, it's enough of a history to it to make you want to go see it just to, just to see what the result is. I mean, sure, I certainly want to see it. I think many people do, but um, again, the, the fact that the, the company, maybe it doesn't mean a whole lot that the company doesn't have much faith in I mean, movie companies are not exactly exemplars of, of, the, of the artistic impulse. Nor, of, nor are they clairvoyant about what's really good, bad, and going to succeed or fail. We'll take a break and come back and talk about uh, television. We've got uh, some interesting things going on. So stay with us. Night Watch will be back in a moment. Now you can try America's most popular $10 love line with the first minute free. Meet someone special free on the love line. Dial 1-900-246-FREE. It's the sweetheart line where lovers meet. Try it free. Dial 1-900-246-FREE. America's love line. You've seen it in newspapers, magazines, on TV. Now catch the excitement. Try it free. Dial 1-900-246-FREE. That's 1-900-246-3733. Now you can try America's most popular $10 love line with the first minute free. Adults only, please. These days, a lot of drug deals take place in locker rooms. Unfortunately, a lot of these drug deals end up in a different kind of locker room. If you or someone you know has a drug problem, contact Habilitat. We can help. Tired of not making it? Don't think you can find a way to move up? Yes, you can with Medigram. We're Medigram America, a leader in one of the fastest growing industries. And we're hiring salespeople, no matter what job you're in, no matter what your experience. We want to talk to you. You'll get complete training, a guaranteed income plan, and management opportunity. Find out how. Call Medigram now for money-making details. 1-800-876-2170. Yes, you can with Medigram. 
When Thomas Edison married Mina Miller, the Wizard of Menlo Park brought his wife to this Victorian mansion near his laboratory here in West Orange, New Jersey. I'm Bill Bradley, inviting you to visit Thomas Edison's home, Glenmont, a part of our national heritage right in our own backyard. Come marvel at the craftsmanship of a...